Hey everyone, welcome back to Living Active Word Podcast. I'm glad you can join again. This week we'll be talking about John the Baptist, how he was a witness of the light. And let's go ahead and read verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. So John has a quite an interesting uh, origin story. <laughs> His parents were old in age. You can find this uh, these details in Luke chapter 1, how the angel Gabriel visited his father. He was old. He didn't believe the prophecy concerning um, his future son, John the Baptizer. And it says that he was to not drink any wine. He was to be set apart for the work of God. And ultimately, that he was to prepare the way for Jesus, for the Christ to come. And so God had a mission. God had a special place for John. And he even says that he was filled with the Spirit as a baby in the womb, which is quite unusual. We don't really find that anywhere else in the Bible. And John also jumped for joy when he met with Jesus while they were both in the womb. Quite interesting stuff, but it's cool. And God had sent him to be a witness. That's what it says even in verse 7. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light. We had talked about how Jesus is the light, a title given to Jesus, that all through him might believe. That that was John's goal, that was his objective, was to bring people to Christ, to for them to know God. And that is truly our objective as well, that we are called to be examples, we're called to be light, we're called to be ambassadors of Christ, we're called to evangelize the world, not not only preachers, not only pastors, not only deacons or evangelists. No, we're all called by our lifestyle and by our words, by the truth to bring people to God, to, to connect people to God and to prepare people's hearts by sharing the gospel that they may know Christ. Verse 8 says, He was not that light. John the Apostle makes it clear that John is not the light, but Jesus is. And he was sent to bear witness of the light. Like testifying in court. That's what John means by witness. And so it's a good it's a good reminder. And I've heard this truth before that there's only one hero of the Bible. It's not Abraham. It's not Moses. It's not David. You fill in the blank. It's not that person. There's only one hero of the Bible. And that is Jesus. And we often need to be reminded of that too. It's not how great we are. It's not about the gifts we have. There's only one hero of the Bible, and we can learn a lot from John. Verse 9, That was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. And so, um, I'm thankful that God, He makes His light. He, He can enlighten every man, but it's up to man to choose whether they want the light in them. Whether they love the darkness more or they love the light more. It's up to each man to choose that for themselves. Verse 10, He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. So we'll take these two verses. He created this world. He is the author of life. He made everything that we see and we don't see. And he came inside of this world. Right, He's far greater than his creation, but he comes and he stoops down and he enters into this world, but it says he came to his own and his own did not receive him. The people who were most uh, knowledgeable of the way that God worked, the prophecies of God, that God had promised that he would send a Messiah, a Savior, and yet these people rejected him by and large. They wanted his healing powers. They wanted his feeding powers, how he was able to miraculously feed people. They wanted that. But most people rejected Jesus. And it it speaks of the Jews as well, that they would have all this knowledge, yet they still rejected their one and only Savior, the Savior of the world. And um, it was also the Romans too, as the Gentiles, they rejected him. So by and large, most people did in fact reject Jesus. And that's the same today. By and large, most people do reject Jesus as a Savior. But look at verse 12. But as many as received him, 
to, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. Look at the contrast. There's, there were many who rejected, but then there are some who received. And the word receive is to lay hold of, is to aggressively take and um, to apply to yourself. And he gave the right to become children of God. But you must believe. And so one time I was uh, at a funeral. We knew this person pretty close to us. Um, and there was this minister, apparently, and he was talking about this person. And, oh, they're with the, we, he, that, this person's with God now, and they're with the angels, and they're looking down on us. And it's like, man, you have no clue about this person's life. This person was radically against God. This person did everything opposite of what the Word of God says. And we are not all children of God. No, not all who are here on this earth are children of God. Yes, we are all created by God, but you must believe. You must receive in order to have the right or the power or the authority to become children of God. In Romans chapter 5, it talks about how we were enemies, right? It's, I'll just read it for, for you. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we have been saved by his life. In Ephesians, it talks about how we are children of wrath. We are not good with God when we are born. We are actually separated from God, and that's why we need a Savior. So you must believe, you must take what God has offered in order to become his children. Verse 13, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. It's not about our efforts. It's not about our desires. It's not about the good we've done. It's not about our nationality. The only way to become a child of God is to become born again. God has to do this work. It's not about what you can do. <laughs> it's not about what you can accomplish or achieve. It's a gift. It's something that only God can do. We cannot give ourselves a new heart. We cannot make our spirits new again. That's the work of God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit. And so now that we are children of God, there are many benefits. And I, I just want to end with this. This is a good reminder. In Romans chapter 8, verses 15 through 17, it says, For you have not received a spirit of slavery, leaving to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoptions as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirits that we are children of God. And if children, heirs, also heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may be also glorified with him. And did you notice back in verse 15 it says, we can cry out, Abba, Father. And that word there is Daddy. There's this tenderness. There's this closeness that we are no longer God's enemies. We are his young children. We are his tender children, the ones whom he loves deeply, the ones whom he will protect, the one whom he will take care of, right? The Bible says that your heavenly father knows what you need even before you even ask. He's there with you. He's there to protect you. And then it talks about how we will be heirs. We receive the spiritual blessings as Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 says, He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. And that would be love, that would be peace, that would be joy. Everything that we ever wanted or desired or needed, God provides it all. He gives us power. He gives us um, His presence. And there's much more. And then there's the physical reality of heaven. But more important than that is the spiritual reality of heaven that will be reigning with Christ forever. I can't think of a better um, gift, a get, better blessing, a better inheritance than that. But truly, there's more, much more than we could even imagine or begin to imagine. I'm excited. I hope you are too. More benefits would be that we're holy, that we're without blame, that we're accepted in the beloved. And then check this out in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. It talks about how it was God's, according to God's good pleasure of his will, that he made us adopted, that he made us his children. That's incredible to me, that we would give God enjoyment, delight, pleasure by being his children. And I hope you're encouraged by this, that you, if your name is written in the book 
of life and you're God's child, you have all these benefits and I encourage you to search the scriptures. What does it mean? What, what more can I learn about being a child of God? There's a lot. And this is just touching the surface. So what, do we, what can we gather from today? Yes, be like John the Baptist. Be a witness. Tell people about the light. We could never be the light. We, we could never um, be the hero. But we can bring people to God. And that's an incredible privilege. We can prepare the way. We can be living and preparing the way until Christ calls us home or he snatches us up in the air. And finally, the fantastic encouragement, the great truth of this section is that we can become, in fact, we can have the right to become children of God if we believe in his name, if we accept what he's done on the cross. Thank you for listening today. And I'm praying for whoever may be listening. God knows. And I hope you're encouraged.